please be seated. Great to see you this morning. I, the last time I was here was two years ago, and uh, here's what I remember from my visit two years ago. One was, you, you guys know how to laugh and tease with each other. That's not always true for church issues. They can be very stuffy. You also, number two, you always eat well. <laughs> Which was proven just by the sort of breakfast reception after the 8 o'clock service. God knows what's going to happen after the dinner. <laughs> Not that I'm complaining, mind you. And the other thing that I like about St. Matthias, and it really ties to the other two, is that you guys are just sort of regular people. And I like that. I can sit down and chat. So we, I've been looking forward to coming. I wish my wife were here. She missed today only because her 88-year-old father just got out of the hospital, and he is at our home convalescing. So hopefully when I left this morning, which was something like quarter of seven, they were fast asleep. Um, so she sends her regrets, because she has a great time when she comes to I think it's something of an auspicious day to think about your patron. So this is for us in this congregation this morning, the Feast of St. Matthias, which is why we have all the readings about who he is. And the lessons, the Philippian lesson, as well as the Gospel lesson of John, say something about who he is. But more importantly than that, not just who he is, I think for a church to name itself after some sort of saint, actually should indicate something about their direction, their vocation, their calling. Life at St. Matthias really ought to look very different from St. Peter's or St. John's, and that there's something about it that I actually believe is a part of the guidance of God. In other words, I don't know what people's motives were when they picked Matthias. He's not one of the more stellar saints, you know. But they did, and therefore God's hand is in it. So what does St. Matthias and his life have to say about St. Matthias Church in Claremont is the question. So what I want to do is talk a little bit about St. Matthias, look at the readings, and say what might be the implications for this congregation and for us as we do our best to try to follow Jesus. Does that make sense to you? Yeah, I know you can nod your head. Remember, we're regular folks. <laughs> okay, so let's look at briefly about what happened with Matthias. We don't know a lot about him. He's actually very obscure. His name doesn't even appear until the story that we have this morning about St. as if he kind of came up out of the woodwork. And yet, he had been around because when Peter stands up and gives this little talk about why we need to get somebody to replace Judas, he said, what we need is someone who has been with us through the life of Jesus starting at John's baptism, which was the very beginning of Jesus' ministry, and as a result was an eyewitness of the resurrection. Now, there weren't that many people like that. And so for Peter to say that's the central requirement for us is something that we need to pay attention to because, like I said, the Gospels don't mention it. But it's important. Why is it important? Because it says something about Matthias' faithfulness. He was willing to be there, even if he didn't get any re leadership recognition. In other words, there's a grace and a humility about him. And, but he was willing to show up. And, in fact, he could have easily said, well, you picked everybody else first and you didn't pick me and it didn't work out with Judas. I don't know whether I want to do this at all. <laughs> and yet, none of that even shows up in the story. All of that says something important to me, both about what it means to be an apostle and what it means to be about a church that's named after Matthias. As it relates to an apostle, it, the, the requirement for apostleship is in the first century that you were eyewitnesses to the resurrection. You actually saw Jesus was alive. Jesus really died. No sort of smoke and mirrors about that and that he actually physically rose up from the dead. We saw his body. We talked to him. He conversed with us. We knew we weren't seeing a ghost. C.S. Lewis's famous line, after telling the story of the disciples by the, the lake, and Jesus is cooking, and he gives them food, and they watch him eat it. And Lewis says, that was one of the things that told me the story was true, because I know that ghosts don't eat fish. <laughs> In other words, 
words, we're real clear about the fact that we believe in a physical, bodily resurrection. No apparitions, sort of ghosts, but a real physical being. And yet, not the same kind of physical resurrection. In other words, there's no resuscitation, because Jesus can do things like appear behind closed doors. Well, we can't do that. So something else is present, but it's still honestly physical. Remember what he says to Thomas. Touch right here where the wound is. In other words, there was real, a real physical body. Well, you see, that is a cataclysmic event that changes the course of human history. What the resurrection does is that it places Jesus in a singularly unique category from every other religious leader on the planet, past, present, and future. We have no records of anyone else rising from the dead and having that kind of spiritual being that can both be fully human and yet come through a closed door. That puts Jesus in an entirely unique place. And that is, in fact, the content of the apostolic witness. That's what it meant to be an apostle, was that you could say, I know beyond a shadow of a doubt that he was dead because I saw him die. And I saw him, and he's alive. That, that's the nature of what it means to be an apostle. And in fact, for me, for example, as a bishop, a bishop is meant to be an inheritor of the apostles. And a part of what that means is that I, sh too, should be able to say, even though I wasn't there at the time, that I believe beyond a shadow of a doubt that Jesus was born fully human, died on the cross, and came from the dead resurrected. In other words, I fully believe that Jesus died completely, and God raised him up from the dead. That's the essence of my responsibility. That's why you have the prayer at the beginning about false apostles. Now, they're referring to Judas. But that the church instead would be raised up by faithful and true pastors. And that hopefully will be people like me. That's, when I read that, I go, oh, God, please let that be true <laughs> in terms of my leadership. But from a, so that for us to be a church that names itself Matthias, number one, has to do with eyewitness to the resurrection, and therefore that kind of faith in Jesus. In other words, what does that imply for St. Matthias Church? It implies that God can call and is calling this group of people to be men and women who can speak with that same kind of confidence. Who are we as Christians? We are people who believe that Jesus rose from the dead. But that's not a myth that it's not merely some kind of asp some sort of aspiration like like the spring and then you know all that sort of thing no 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 a real event happened within the context of human history that has in fact changed the course of human history that it happened then and because that's the case i know the alive presence of jesus christ in my life and that i'm not deluded some people will think you're crazy. I said, I said to those being confirmed, I said, I want you to know that I think what you're doing is courageous. I, I said, I know I have friends who think what I do is silly and maybe even a little dangerous because they think I believe in a delusion. So for people to stand up and say, yes, I will follow Jesus Christ. I believe in as my Lord. That's a courageous thing. And to say... This is what we're committed to. So what should St. Matthias Church Claremont look like? It should look like a people who have that kind of clarity and that kind of belief in his resurrection. And because that's the case, they really are growing in their relationship with Christ. I mean, the wonder of what Jesus promises in the gospel about abiding in him, about bearing fruit, about having that kind of deep personal relationship where, as Jesus says, I'm the vine, you're the branches. That kind of inextricable link is the gift of people who walk in Christ. They know not just that they believe, but they belong to him, that they are kept in his presence. He holds them in the hollow of his hand. And because that's the case, that gives us a certain kind of boldness. I know that I belong to Jesus. 
And because I belong to Jesus, I can walk into the day and know that he's gone before me. He has prepared the way. I'm his. Nothing's going to be a surprise. He will, in fact, even if I get surprised, it's not a surprise to him. And he will, in fact, see us through. That's the heartbeat of St. Matthias's, you see, boldness. You, we live in a world where everybody flies all over the place. But for those apostles, it was incredibly countercultural. For they who had grown up in this little spot in Palestine all of their lives, to literally at that point when they step up to say, I'll go wherever Jesus sends me. And we have stories of these apostles ended up in places like India for Thomas. We don't know exactly where Matthias went. The stories are in conflict. Some say he went to Eastern Europe. Some say that he went to Italy. But the fact of the matter is, is that for them to do that, their friends would have looked at them and said, are you crazy? That's incredibly dangerous. You could actually die on the way there just by your boat capsizing, much less what's going to happen once you get there. I mean, these are phenomenal people of extraordinary courage and have had everything to do with their willingness to say, because I know I belong to Jesus, I will go where he sends me, because I can trust in him. And that even, even if something should happen to the body, well, that will be sad for a lot of people. I'll miss them too. But the fact of the matter is that for me, it means I get ushered into eternity. So I get to go to heaven. What's wrong with that? And that gave them the courage to even face death. Because the reason we're in red today is that tradition happens, says that Matthias was martyred for being a Christian. Something that we're now seeing with our own eyes, are we not? With the plight of Christians in many parts of the world. It's not a remote, it's right now. Because they were willing to walk with that kind of courage, when the call came to them through this process of trying to discern you know, what they were really doing is something akin to what we would call throwing dice. You know, two, who are the people who know the resurrection? Well, we've got two who've been with us from the beginning. Okay, God, show us which one it should be. And they would cast lots. And if it turned out that the lot that was cast was the one that Matthias held, he got it. Or justice, as it turned out, it was Matthias. In other words, it'd be interesting to see if we did people for a nation like that. Um, but that's what they did. And so, in that light, Matthias didn't stop and say, well, it didn't work out for Judas, I'm not sure. He was willing to step forward and be available for God. And the point is, is that he could have said, and this is very contemporary for us, yeah, I, Judas was somebody that Jesus picked and looked at what happened to him. He actually was completely corrupt. I know about those church people. They're really corrupt, aren't they? <laughs> They're not trustable, are they? I mean, that's what a lot of us say. And I can agree. I, I know some church leaders I wouldn't trust either. But what they did not do was deter Matthias from saying yes to the call that was in front of him. Because his faith in Christ was stronger than his suspicion of somebody else's bad example. That's the point. So that they can do what they feel like they're, they're going to do, and if it's wrong, that's up to God. But me, I'm going to move forward. They're willing to step in, even if circumstances should point to the contrary. And so what does that say about St. Matthias? That means your people, you are to be a people who can get out there and give who are quick to volunteer, who are part of things because you're committed to actually making an eternal difference in each other's lives and in the life of your community. Claremont ought to know about St. Matthias, a church that cares for each other, a church that's willing to serve the community, a church where if you come in, they're going to watch out for you. That's, that feels like Matthias to me. And even in terms of volunteering, there are two different ways to do it. Let me, let me show you something. If you, and I'm not, I'm not picking on the altar, by the way. I'm going to talk about that. I have been.
live in churches where the linens are gorgeous, the flowers are amazing, but the attitude with which the altar guild, and this can be any group, it can be true for the vestry or even Sunday school teachers, is, you know why I'm doing this? Because nobody else can do a good as job as I do, and you better not touch me. <laughs> in other words, it, it's somewhat self-serving. It's entirely different to do just as fine a job because you understand that beauty matters and that, in fact, it's meant to draw people to Christ. In other words, when the church is clean and looks good, when the flowers are right, when the altar is set properly, it actually is meant to not turn your attention to them, but through them to the presence of God who loves and cares for people and someone for whom beauty really does matter. So it, it not just, it's not just a question of volunteering. It has to do with why are you doing it? What's it for? Is it so you can get a thank you note? Is it so you can get the accolade? Now, we should honor each other. I'm not against the scriptures real clear. Honor to whom honor is due. But in the end, the motive is not about my, for me. It has everything to do with so that something, someone, might be drawn to Christ. That's the apostolic witness. So today, what I would want to do is ask you. We have people who are being presented today. And they're making a commitment to publicly serve Christ. That's the essence of what confirmation really means. And you will also make promises the very same way. You will be reminded of the commitments you make when you are confirmed. And I would encourage you to think about that carefully. As we say the yeses together, understand, especially in this church, St. Matthias Claremont. That you're willing to be a people who, by God's help, are strong in faith, willing to volunteer, and are passionate about making a difference in this community, among this group of people, and out there in this county. That, it seems to me, is reflective of St. <laughs> Matthias' witness. It should be ours, too. Amen. Amen. Amen.